All right, so at this point, you may have heard about Q-Star, the leaked next generation OpenAI's new model that some people are saying is a sign that we're approaching or we're already at AGI. According to Reuters, some at OpenAI believe that Q-Star could be a breakthrough in the startup search for what's known as artificial general intelligence. Now, it's important to understand that a lot of this is its leaks, its anonymous sources, its little clues and bits and pieces of information that we're all trying to put together. So just kind of keep that in mind that when we're talking about these things, I'm not claiming anything to be true. I'm not trying to convince you that something's happening, that we know something for sure. I am, and a lot of other people following this, we're just trying to make sense of what's happening because it really does seem that something big is happening. Specifics are a bit murky. Now it seems like a lot of these AI labs, these tech companies that are that are working on AI, it seems that they are getting a little bit more secretive with what research they put out there. And a lot of these people that are in the Bay Area working on these projects, there are these whispers that we're getting very, very close. So just recently, Sam Altman said this. In the last couple of weeks, he was in the room where we, so OpenAI or humanity, however you want to translate that, quote, we sort of push the veil of ignorance back and the frontier of discovery forward, which sounds like, and this is what a lot of people are guessing, is that Sam Altman and Ilya Sutskever and maybe some other people were inside a room when they saw something, a demo of some new breakthrough technology that pushed the frontier of discovery forward, that expanded our knowledge, which normally is a great thing. But a day later, the OpenAI board fires Sam Altman. This sets a whole bunch of things in motion. We've covered it before in a few videos. I'm not going to go too much over it, but it seems like quite a few people were spooked. They were unnerved by what they saw. Some had even suggested what they saw could be a threat to humanity. Now, what I think happened is that all the super powerful venture capitalists that are interested in what's happening at OpenAI, all the Microsoft people, they used whatever money, influence, et cetera, that they had, and they really kind of tightened the screws on the people trying to seem like maybe destroy OpenAI or at least try to merge it with Anthropic. What are the case, the quote unquote rebellion was quelled. Now it comes out recently, just 24, 48 hours ago, that the secret scary slash exciting project that is making everybody act so crazy is called Q star. We don't know too much about Q star. We don't know what it's referring to. We just know that it's pretty good at math. Tons of people have been speculating on what this could mean. A lot of people thinking it's, it has to do something with Q learning, which is basically how we have trained robots and AI in the past to how we reward them for certain behaviors to improve their learning abilities. And over time, as they get better at something, they know which of their actions lead to the best result. And in my mind, I kind of think of that as kids, we tend to be more open to new experience. We tend to try more things out. But over time, as we get older, we kind of figure out what we need to do to get the highest reward, right? We don't try as many things. We kind of know what we're supposed to be doing. And more and more, we settle into patterns. To me, Q learning kind of seems to resemble that a little bit. There's a lot of people in the AI space that are talking about this. I try to listen to everyone, but not everyone is always accurate. Some people have their own hidden agendas. Some people seem to be very biased. Some people are a little bit too hypey, whatever. But it's important to have good counsel when you're trying to learn about this stuff. For me, one of those people that I kind of tend to always trust is Dr. Jim Fan, one of the senior researchers at NVIDIA. So he's a senior AI scientist at NVIDIA, Stanford PhD, and kind of like one of his lifelong missions is to build AI agents, as he says, across realities. So if you've seen the Voyager, Minecraft Voyager, the GPT-4 learns to play Minecraft, we did a video about that. Another one of his projects was called Eureka. I did a video about that. Unfortunately, for some reason, Google didn't quite push it to a broader audience. It was fascinating because it shows that GPT-4 is really good at training robots in these sort of virtual simulations. It's mind-blowing. We might have to redo that video because I don't think enough people saw it. So this whole time, I'm kind of hoping that Dr. Jim Van comes out and kind of shed some light on this Q star thing. Is it nonsense? Is there something to it? And yes, that actually happened today. He says, in my decades spent on AI, I've never seen an algorithm that so many people fantasize about. Just from a name, no paper, no stats, no product. So let's reverse engineer the Q star fantasy. My heart sank a little bit because I'm like, crap. Now I'm going to look like the guy with the tinfoil hat on that's promoting various nonsense. That's not true. That's not, doesn't have any scientific muster to it. But as I started reading this, I'm realizing that 
it seems like this Q star thing maybe has more basis in reality than we first even realized. So let's dive in. Let's find out what this whole thing is about after Dr. Jim Fan, another person replied. His name is Nathan Lambert. I like how he has in his profile, he says, has PhD in some credentials. I, I, I love I love how that's downplayed. Oh, just, you know, PhD and some other stuff, whatever. So it looks like he writes at interconnects.ai, and I'll link the link in the show notes. But he did a post today, November 24th, saying the Q star hypothesis, tree of thought, reasoning, process, reward models, and supercharging synthetic data. And Dr. Jim Fan responds, oh, wow, I got scooped. Haha, <laughs> you listed a few references that I haven't even read it yet. Thanks for sharing. So first of all, let me start out by thanking these two AI researchers, these people that are doing so much for AI. We're going to be looking at what they're writing, their thoughts. So it's great to see people like this kind of correcting the discussion in the in the right direction. For example, this leaked paper was posted to Reddit. So here at the top, it's saying, furthermore, Qualia, so now, so they're referring to this as Qualia, has demonstrated an ability to statistically significantly improve the way in which it selects its optimal action selection policies in different deep Q networks, exhibit, exhibiting metacognition. We'll talk about what this means. This, we don't know if it's real or not. David Shapiro covered this in his channel. He went deep into what this may or may not mean. We may or may not get back to it later, but really fast, there's just a few things that I think will help understand what is happening. So just let me do a quick rapid fire sort of summarizations of what's going on so that maybe you have a better idea of understanding what Jim and Nathan will be talking about here. So first of all, so this is ORCID 2 released on 18th of November. So just very recently, like less than seven days ago, and it's Microsoft Research. So this is the continuation of the ORCA one paper. And there's a number of cool discoveries here. I did a video about this and I, I have it and it's kind of ready to go, but I know if I release it right now, because of everything else that's gonna ha that's happening, it's just gonna flatline. That's just kind of how the Google algorithm works. It's just, it's just, there's like zero chance of it getting picked up. But here's the big headline news out of this paper. And I think it's important to understand this piece of it. And then it's gonna be important to understand the tree of thoughts, what that means. And they do talk about tree of thoughts here, although I don't think they call it that, interestingly enough. But here's what they do here. So they're using GPT-4 to create synthetic data. Synthetic data, when you hear that word, when you hear that phrase, what that means is, you know, previously we used human data, human generated data to train these models, right? So we take all of the pictures and images and photos of, let's say, dogs that, that humans took and drew and whatever, and we train it to draw dogs or generate images of dogs, right? So after a while, it gets pretty good at generating images of dogs. And same thing with text, music, whatever. One concern was we're going to run out of high quality human generated data, right? There's only so many pictures of dogs that a human being can take, right? There's only so many books and high quality texts that we have created. And it seems like for a lot of these AI models, the more, the better. So basically in order to keep growing it, we got to feed it more and more and more. So we thought we're going to reach some sort of a, a, a roadblock at some point. Some people have suggested that the way around that is to, to train it on synthetic data, meaning once they get good enough at doing this stuff, they, meaning the AI models, they will produce the data, the text, the images, et cetera, to train the next generation of models. And we didn't know whether or not that will work. A lot of people said it's not going to work. There's going to be this like little errors here and there that will just kind of compound on themselves and just kind of corrupt the whole process like that synthetic data will not work. What this research seems to suggest is that synthetic data might work great and it might work in maybe even different ways than we thought and in much better ways than we thought. So here's the main point of this paper worker too, at least the main point towards what we're talking about. So the researchers wrote a very in-depth kind of system instruction for GPT-4. So it's like a prompt, but it's sort of like the main prompt that we give it. And they, in great detail, wrote out how to solve a problem. And, and so the problem was to put several different sentences in the correct order. So they take like a story, they jumble it up, and then they ask, and they ask the A models to sort it in the correct order. And so they start by creating the best prompt that's going to produce the best results from GPT-4. So you can see here, there's like five steps, like identify the main theme, look for any cause and effect relationships between the sentences. You know, think about which sentence could be the start of the story and then do this and this and this, and then finally write down the correct order. So basically they're meticulously walking this model through how to solve this problem step by step by step by step. And this resembles a paper that um, was called Tree of Thoughts. So here it is. Uh, so Princeton, Google DeepMind, et cetera. So I unfortunately don't have my notes on this, but 
This is kind of like one of the main images that they've been using to, to show it. So normally if you ask ChatGPT a question, this is what that looks like. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer. A while back, OpenAI put out a paper showing how to get better results out of these AI language models, which we now kind of just call chain of thought or chain of thought prompting COT. So we tell it to think through everything step by step, right? So we ask it a question, we tell it think through step by step, like really reason everything out. And so it goes step by step. And then the output oftentimes is much better because it took the time to do that. And then there's self-consistency with COT that, that doesn't matter right now. And then there's tree of thoughts. So this is where we think through the various sort of branching chains of thought. We think through each one and kind of gather data from that thought process and then come back to the input to finally answer the question with all of those sort of data that we thought through. So this might be a little bit confusing. Here's what really made it make sense for me. So the AI model is given a couple random sentences. One is, it isn't difficult to do a handstand if you just stand on your hands, okay? Two is, it caught him off guard that space, as in the outer space, it smelled of seared steak. Three, when she didn't like a guy who was trying to pick her up, she started using sign language. Four, each person who knows you has a different perception of who you are. So those are four random sentences. If I asked you to write a coherent passage consisting of four short paragraphs and the end sentence of each paragraph must be one of those four. So in other words, create a story where each paragraph ends with one of those sentences. Think about that for a second. I think most humans would have maybe a little bit of a hard time. I mean, some people are more creative and verbally fluent than others, but I, I think a lot of people would have a hard time because one is about space. One is like a pun, like it's difficult. It's not difficult to do a handstand if you just stand on your hands. Like, was that a pun or a joke? One is uh, when she didn't like a guy who was trying to pick her up, she started using sign language. One is more like about different perception of who you are. Like, how do you combine them all into one? You might have to sit down and think about it for a little bit. So if I said, give me an answer right now, you might be hard pressed to just spit it out. And language models naturally, like if you just prompt them and you just expect the answer, normally the output would be pretty bad. The passages, the story they make up connecting those, it's not going to really make any sense. But if we give it something like this, you know, we ask, okay, so identify the main topics, the main themes, how could they be connected? Think about the different ways that they could be connected, right? So we think through multiple different approaches, kind of a brainstorming session about the various ways that we can approach this. And only then with sort of that brainstorming session complete, do we try to write the story. And so in this case, with these random sentences, GPT-4, you know, throws out several different ways that it could possibly connect them in terms of like kind of what lens to view it from. And then it thinks, okay, so one of the choices that I thought of is choice two. It offers an interesting perspective by using the required end sentences to present a self-help book's content. It connects the paragraphs with the same theme of self-improvement and embracing challenges, making for a coherent passage. I'll link that video below if you want to see it. But the point is it created a coherent way to connect all those sentences. If you read a book that it wrote, you'd be like, okay, this, this, it made sense. All right. So that was Microsoft Research plus Princeton from a while back. This is their brand new research saying we can create these prompts that kind of simulate these tree of thoughts thinking to get GPT-4 to produce a great response to these verbal problems. So they get, so they teach GPT-4 how to do that with that long prompt. And then they ask it a series of questions where it solves it using this approach. And it does very well. So then what they do is they collect a bunch of these, something close to a million. 817,000 training instances. And so, and then they take that data and they take this smaller model, which is open sourced. This is the Orca 2 model. And they train it on that data produced by GPT-4. But here's the trick. Here's the interesting point. They don't show Orca 2, this new smaller model, this open source model. They don't show it this, the system instructions. So they don't tell it the step-by-step -step way of doing it. They just show it the problem and the solution, the problem and the solution. And they do that 817,000 times. And at the end of that, that smaller model is capable of solving that particular set of problems. It's able to reason about those set of problems as good as other models that are five to 10 times larger. And the cost to create those little submodels, as far as I can tell, I try to do the math on it. I think it's like 4,000 or maybe up to 9,000, depending on what your kind of, uh, what your costs are, but it's not massive. So what I think this is saying is that if you have access to GPT-4, you can use that to create synthetic data, large sets of synthetic data to train these inexpensive open source models to do certain reasoning tasks, certain specific reasoning tasks. And then they're able to do it very well.
So let's take a look at Nathan Lambert's paper, The Q Hypothesis. Tree of Thoughts Reasoning. So that's what we're talking about, those, that idea of thinking through multiple branching chains of thought or branches of thought, and then figuring out how to like get that data that we thought about and then answer the question, the reasoning based on that. Another way of thinking of it is when you're solving a crossword puzzle, like, you know, how you might think that something goes in a particular section. So you, you're like, oh, it's, you know, this might be donut, right? But then you have to also line up with all the other answers that you have. So you might think through multiple different scenarios or playing Scrabble. It's kind of the same approach. You might have several different potential words, but you got to think through which one's going to give you the most points, et cetera. So you can think of that as tree of thoughts reasoning and humans do that naturally. And it seems like these AI models, if we teach them to do that, their results are improved because of it. All right. So he starts how Reuters reported on Q star, which we went over uh, in our last video. And so he's saying Q star, if real, again, keep in mind that a lot of this is speculation, clearly links the two core themes from reinforcement learning literature, Q values and A star, a classic graph search algorithm. So we briefly looked at this. I hope this is pronounced this. This is pronounced A star, I assume. I actually just realized I've never heard it spoken. Just I read about it, but I'm get I'm gonna I'm gonna keep saying A star. So A star, a classic graph search algorithm. So if you think about a problem where you're trying to get from one place to another, A star is that the ability to just move from one place to another. That's how and PCs in various video games might get around. And then Q values, that's what we talked about with sort of trying to figure out which of our actions produce the greatest rewards. And that's how these AI agents will learn to interact with a new environment. They keep trying different stuff, seeing what works, what doesn't, etc. And over time, so that Q star, that's kind of like when they figure out the best possible approach to get the most reward. So kind of like in chess, what is the best possible move, right? So yes, there's an argument that Q could be just referred to the value function of the optimal policy. So it's like the best chess move, but that would be silly. So he's saying it's much more likely that it's some sort of a link between Q values and A star, which is what a lot of people have been saying. And so he's saying my initial hypothesis, which I clearly labeled as a tin hat theory, was a vague merging of Q learning and A star search. So again, that's kind of like what a lot of people's thoughts are right now about what this is. As I've dug into this in more detail, I've become convinced that they are doing something powerful by searching over language slash reasoning steps via tree of thoughts reasoning in a much smaller of a leap than people believe. The reason for the hyperbole is the goal of linking large language model training and usage to the core components of deep reinforcement learning that enable success like AlphaGo, self-play and look ahead planning. So AlphaGo, that's out of Google DeepMind, and we've seen some incredible things coming out of Google DeepMind, including AlphaFold, which is learning how to how proteins fold the 3D shape of it, which was very difficult for us to do before AI kind of was able to figure out the 3D structures of these proteins. That was a massive breakthrough in 2020 that will open a lot of doors for drug discovery, for for fixing certain very like rare diseases and eventually maybe not so rare, maybe most diseases. So it's a very exciting avenue. And then also they had AlphaGo, which beat the greatest player in the world at the game of Go. And then there was also, we did a video where Google DeepMind, they figured out how to optimize certain, certain code to make it much more effective. And what's really interesting about all of them, what I think kind of links all those together is that they kind of build the way this AI approaches problem, kind of like a game. So if you think about Google DeepMind's AI playing StarCraft and playing Go and playing chess, but also solving these very complex biological problems and also optimizing code. You might think that the process is very different, but as Demis Asabis himself is saying, who he's the founder of Google DeepMind, as he is saying, they use the idea of games for a lot of this. It's a great concept because the AI starts playing out a game. So for example, when they were optimizing code, it would write a the first line of code and then the second line of code. Each one would be thought of as like a move in chess, for example, and they would get certain points. Like if it was able to optimize the code in a shorter number of lines, it would win the game, right? So they 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 take that idea of games and they make this AI play games with, you know, a high score or whatever, but they just apply it to these complicated problems and it works. Now keep that in mind because as you'll see in just a second and a spoiler alert, Demis Hassabi, so again, the, the main guy at 
Google DeepMind, said a while back that DeepMind Gemini, so that's their new big model that's, that was supposed to be here now, but they're pushing it back into 2024, it will use AlphaGo style algorithms to boost reasoning. Even if Q star is not what we think, Google will certainly catch up with their own. So we'll come back to that, but that's 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 an important thing to, to think about is that these different AI labs, the best AI labs in the world, you know, they're very secretive and they, they're not really sharing information with one another, but it seems like, so when they're saying, when Demis Ashavis is going, this seems to be the way to go. And then OpenAI is like also saying the same thing. That probably means something because they're both seeing the same thing. They're both kind of going in the same direction. So let's go back to, to this here. So self-play is the idea that an agent can improve its gameplay by playing against slightly different versions of itself because it will progressively encounter more challenging situations. In the space of LLMs, it is almost certain that the largest portion of self-play will look like AI feedback rather than competitive processes. So way back in the day when we were just beginning to teach AI how to play chess, we would give it human games. Like here's how humans play this game. And then we would tell it how much each piece is worth. So we would say, you know, the pawn is worth one point, the knight is worth three points, bishop is worth three points, etc. And you know, it did okay. The That AI did okay. But this new wave of AI, we don't start it by telling it what we, the humans, have figured out. We we, we tell it, you know, play against itself and, and figure out how to do it. And that AI just beats humans by a large margin. Like it's it's much better than humans at playing chess. So it's almost like us telling it what we figured out beforehand is like almost like it it's worse for it. It's, it's almost better off just figuring it out on its own. Have you ever seen that in the workplace when, you know, somebody is taking over a project that's maybe not going so well and the people that have been our project are like, well, do you want us to tell you what we figured out so far, or what our thoughts are? And right, the new team that's taking over is like, no, like not interested. We'll, we'll figure it out ourselves. That's kind of like a diss, right? That's not a nice thing to do. But in this case, AI is better if it learns on its own from itself. And what's interesting here is that over time, it actually came up with different values for the chess pieces than what humans have thought of, you know, in the whole history of us playing chess. So we thought that the pawn is worth one point. And so, I mean, it says, you know, this is a uh, piece values according to alpha zero. So it starts with one. I mean, that's probably just the baseline. So one to one, it that doesn't matter. That's just the, what we're setting the base at. And then we thought that the knight is worth three points. It's setting at 3.05. So you see how how accurate it is like no not three you know it's much more accurate than that right and then the bishop is three points it thinks the bishop is 3.33 the rook is 5.63 whereas we thought it was five and the queen is worth it thinks the queen is worth 9.5 right and you might say well who's right who's wrong since it beats easily any grandmaster at chess any human grandmaster i would say it you know i would assume <laughs> these are accurate it's much more accurate than humans are. All right, so self-play, again, so it's the idea that AI plays against itself with slightly different versions of itself because it will progressively encounter more challenging situations. So in the space of LLMs, it's almost certain that the largest portion of self-play will look like AI feedback rather than competitive processes. And look-ahead planning is the idea of using a model of the world to reason into the future and produce better actions or outputs. So this is interesting. So I guess they use Dolly 3 to create this visualization of a uh, tree of thoughts. That's pretty cool. All right, now we're talking about tree of thoughts, prompting techniques like take a deep breath and think step by step are now expanding into advanced methods for inference with parallel computations and heuristics. This will make more sense in just a second. So tree of thoughts, and he kind of goes over what tree of thoughts is. We went over that a little bit. And so he's saying that tree of thoughts seems like the first recursive prompting technique for improving inference performance, meaning that it kind of builds on itself, builds on its own thoughts. So it thinks through, it brainstorms, and then it takes that and thinks more through it and then more, et cetera. So it's kind of building upon its own thoughts. And so next here, he's talking about PRMs, process reward models. And the core idea of this is to assign a score to each step of reasoning rather than the complete message. So if you think back to taking various math exams back in school, you know, sometimes you just get the points for the correct answer. But I feel like more often than not, they grade your you showing your work, right? So maybe you get a few points for stating the problem correctly, a few points for working it out, a few points for making sure all your calculations are right, and then a few points for finally, you know, 
having the right answer in the right format, whatever. So basically you get graded based on not just the correct answer, but also your work. That's what a process reward models could be thought of. And so in AI's paper called, let's verify step-by-step. Step. So here we have a math problem. So as you can see here, so two solutions of the same problem graded by PRM, process reward models. And so the solution on the left is correct while the solution on the right is incorrect. And so the green backgrounds indicate a high PRM score, meaning it's right. A red background indicates a low PRM score. And so next he's saying the prompting from a tree of thoughts gives diversity to the generations, which a policy can learn to exploit with access to a PRM. So as I'm understanding this in this, I, this kind of diagram of the tree of thoughts, right? So we tend to grade it based on the output. So, you know, if it gets the output right, we're like, yay, plus 10, good job. And if it gets the output wrong, we're like, boom, minus 10, bad. But what if the model could go through each step, each thought, each one of those little, each one of these little sub steps and grade it like this was bad. So it's minus one, but this was good. So it's plus one and this was excellent. So it's plus two, right? So it's, it's, it's learning which reasoning steps lead to the greatest possible output. And it looks like he's got a, I assume this is a, uh, a podcast of the retort. Oh, you're finished. Well, allow me to retort. All right, next we have putting it together what Q star could be. And so what he's saying is that Q star seems to be using process reward models to score tree of thoughts, reasoning data, and then optimized with offline reinforcement learning. So we, we know that OpenAI is already using kind of offline reinforcement learning. So basically, you know, they train the model and then this base model comes out, which most people are not going to use. It's a text completion model. It's, it's powerful, right? In, in, in many ways, it's more powerful than the chat version of it, the instruction tune model. But then we use reinforcement learning with human feedback to kind of tune it to the way we want it, right? And it comes out going, hi, I'm your helpful assistant. And that's what chat GPT is. That's what everybody's using. That's the kind of back and forth conversation that we have with it, et cetera. But it, it sounds like what he's talking about is something like this. So as the AI is thinking through all the various different steps, each little thought, each little output is getting graded on its own by AI. So it's, it's saying, okay, this is, this is a good idea. This is not so good. And over time, as you're going through these thoughts, this is what that idea of approaching Q star, the best possible reward. That's what that, that's where that comes in. So over time, it figures out how to best reason about how to get to wherever it's going. What is the best way of thinking to come to the right conclusion? And as I'm saying that, I got to say, that seems one, that seems pretty brilliant. Number two, it seems, it just kind of feels right. I don't know. And the last step is where the rumored vast computing resources use AI to label every step with a score instead of humans. Synthetic data is king. So that's what we were talking about with Orca 2, where GPT-4 generates the data needed for the training. And with trees rather than single width paths so via chain of thought, giving more and more options later on to arrive at the right answer. So I hope that makes sense. I'm not sure. I got to Once I replay it, sometimes when I record a video and then I replay it, I'm like, oh my God, that didn't make any sense. So maybe I'll have to go back and add some more TLDR here. But like I've said before, a lot of this Q star stuff is aligning with all the other research that's coming around using multiple models to do different things, some for output, some for checking that output. And then also kind of analyzing all the outputs and all the, you know, the grading of the outputs, kind of putting it together, trying to kind of synthesize that into some new information together, like some new insights. It seems that stacking these AI layers on one another, that seems like the way to go. And obviously the vast computing resources is what will be required for that. The ton of computer resources tracks with the rumor that I've heard one or more of the big tech players, Google, Anthropic, Cohere, et cetera, are creating pre-trained sized data set from process supervision or RLAIF. So that's, we haven't talked about this before, but so RLHF is reinforcement learning with human feedback, right? Where the human sitting there is like, good job. No, that's bad. So this is just, we take out the H, we take out the human and we stick in the AI. So it's reinforcement learning with AI feedback. So now the AI is sitting there and going, good job. No, that's bad, et cetera. But it's doing that really fast, right? A million times a second, whatever. So it's faster, it's better uh, and much more scalable than having humans do that could, could ever possibly be. The gap to openly available models in this area worries me. So I think if I understand correctly, what he's saying is that that would require, you know, massive amounts of hardware, of NVIDIA chips, of, you know, thousands of hours of GPUs, which may not be available for open source models, meaning that the big companies will win and will likely have kind of a foothold on, on AI. Maybe that's the moat that they've been looking for. So back to Dr. Jim Fan. So he, as I understand it, at least talks about some of the 
so the, the ideas are similar. He approaches it from a slightly different perspective, but I think that they're both talking about the concepts are very similar. And so here he's saying, so AlphaGo does self-play. So it's playing against its own older checkpoints. So for any move, as it's playing against itself, it's also playing against all the previous moves, the various different versions of itself that can that play as the opponent. And as self-play continues, this is saying that both its ability to make good moves and its ability to understand the board and who is more likely to win, both of those are improved iteratively. As the policy gets better at selecting moves, there's more data to learn from, and it provides better feedback to the policy, to the AI. So that completes an ingenious perpetual motion machine. By the way, I mean, this is, this is when people talk about AI safety, when they talk about the various threats that AI poses. I mean, this is where I think most people need to understand this is where it gets a little bit scary, this perpetual motion machine, but because the motion in this case is the AI getting smarter. So it's perpetually getting smarter, getting smarter and better at getting smarter and doing that recursively and doing that, you know, faster and faster. So this is Wait But Why, a blog by Tim Urban. So this is from 2015, the beginning of 2015. So he was talking about some of this stuff long before, um, you know, it was on a lot of people's radar. And so one of the things that I really like how he described is we think of AI as, you know, for most of human history, we wouldn't say it was anywhere near as smart as humans, right? It couldn't do anything that humans could do. And people talked about one day AI sort of becoming as smart as humans. And when we phrase it that way, you would think that, you know, if you were thinking of this AI intelligence as a train, you know, we kind of think of it as like, this is the human level intelligence station. So this is, you know, here's AI arriving at human level intelligence. And we think that, you know, we, we think that it would like slowly pull into the train station and we'd say, oh, hi, you're now as smart as we are. Right. But the reality is, you know, here's a guy going, it's coming fast. Right. It goes zoom and it's gone. Like, AI intelligence, it's not going to stick around at our intelligence level for a long time. If it's, you know, a perpetual motion machine that's ever improving itself, you know, it'll be as smart as for a split second, and then it will be much smarter and it's going to continue. And so this is on a great chart of like the intelligence staircase, right? You got the insects here, then you get something like a, like a chicken, here's a chimp, and this is us humans, right? And then there's this like continuing staircase where there's nothing here as far as we know, right? But then, you know, this is the biological range. This is what all of intelligence as we know it in biology is. And then this is what artificial super intelligence might look like. And so here, Dr. Jim Fan is saying, an AI can never become superhuman just by imitating human data alone. So that's what kind of AlphaGo and all those showed. And this is what I was talking about in my previous video, where we're now kind of walking through the door of AIs training the next evolution of AIs. Like we're not quite there yet, but we're like walking through that door. Like now it's creating data to train itself. And there's more and more stuff that's coming out that's showing Showing that moving forward, our abilities, human abilities to train robots and AI, it's like we're bad at that. And that AI is going to be much better at that. And that's one of the things that Dr. Jim Sfans, his Eureka paper was showing is that, you know, humans have tried for a long time to figure out how to get a robot hand to twirl a pencil. Like, you know how some kids are able to like twirl a pen or a pencil in their hands? That was extremely difficult. But for GPT-4, it was fairly easy. They were able to get it to do that by having the GPT-4 write the reward process. You can think of it as like the code for how to do that. And so what it showed is that as our abilities to do those complicated things declines, right? We're as good as GPT-4 for like the easy tasks, like there's not too much of a difference, but as it gets more complex, like human ability to do that stuff just falls, right? Whereas the AI's abilities, it gets better and it gets better in ways that we can't even, we would not have thought of similar to how AlphaGo beat uh, Lisa Dole. Like there was this one move that it made where you see everybody going up, uh, the AI made a mistake. That's a bad move. Why would it do that? But then you realize that that was like the pivotal move in the game that was extremely strong. And we, the humans, didn't figure it out until the end of the game. It's like, oh, wait, that was a good move. So it makes these novel moves, these new moves that we don't we don't think of. But GPT-4, when creating reward functions for robot hands and for how to optimize software and stuff like that, it creates new novel moves that are different from how humans think, you know? And so here he's translating that into, you know, Q star. So you would have the opening eyes, most powerful internal GPT responsible for actually implementing the thought traces that solve a math problem, for example. And then you have another GPT that scores how likely each intermediate reasoning step is correct. And then he, he breaks down the P 
PRMs, the process supervised reward models, or the ORMs, outcome supervised reward models. So that's what we talked about. Instead of grading the final output, the final answer, we're grading, you know, the show your work part. What are the thinking steps? What are the reasoning steps that led to that answer? And so the outcome, so just to green the answer, that's sparse reward. So you just get these rewards, these corrections every once in a while, whereas PRM's process supervised reward models, that's dense reward. So you're getting fast feedback throughout the whole process. Like, oh, you're, you know, you're getting colder, you're getting warmer, you're constantly being guided in the right direction. And again, I'll link the links if you want to read through the entire thing. This is fascinating, but I don't want to get too deep into everything. And I do want people to check out the blog, check out Dr. Jim's fan Twitter X profile and give him a follow. I think he's a, he's, he's a great follow. And so he concludes with, you know, just like AlphaGo, just how it has different parts of itself that improve each other iteratively, as well as learn from human expert annotations whenever available. So a better policy for LLMs, for large language models, will help the tree of thought search explore better strategies, which in turn collects better data for the next round. And so Demis Hasabi said a while back that DeepMind Gemini will use AlphaGo style algorithms to boost reasoning. Even if Q star is not what we think, Google will certainly catch up with their own. If I can think of the above, they surely can. And he's saying that the above is mainly about reasoning. So it's not necessarily that creativity, that synthetic data will be better for creativity, but for reasoning, it might be a lot better. I got to say, at the end of the day, what really just makes sense to me is this idea of AlphaGo plus LLM. So AlphaGo and also AlphaFold, and, and I forget all the names. I think all the names are Alpha something. Whatever DeepMind releases, they seem to be building it around that same idea of this idea of self-play, of trying different stuff, improving on itself, kind of making it a little bit more into a game with a reward, a high score, etc. And it's always trying to beat its own high score. And it's running through many different games per second, millions of games per second or whatever, whatever that rate is. And each one, it gets more of an understanding about how to approach the problem more effectively. And then there's this whole other branch of how we approach AI and that's LLMs. And it's something completely separate. And both are extremely powerful in their own ways. And each has certain weaknesses that the other one seems to be good at. So combining the two seems like it would be a great idea. And maybe at the end of the day, maybe that's what QSTAR is. It's taking the amazing stuff that Google DeepMind produced, the, the, the mind-blowing stuff that they've accomplished. And it's also taking the mind-blowing stuff that OpenAI produced and merging them together. Could that be the big breakthrough that scared the crap out of everybody? That made some people want to, you know, delete OpenAI or at least try to kind of cripple it and merge it with somebody else to try to prevent this stuff from rapidly getting out there. And to top it all off, here's uh, Jimmy Apple. So he's the one that's been leaking a lot of information from OpenAI. It seems like he has some insider data that he's sharing with the world through his anonymous account. And the more and more time goes on, it, it does seem like he, it's, it's getting pretty obvious at this point that he does have access to some internal data. He tends to say things weeks before they happen. So I kind of tend to look to what he's saying, even though he's like very cryptic about it, but it does kind of give you a taste of what's to come. And here he reposted somebody saying, one simple way that OpenAI is looking to acquire superhuman data is to have models be evaluated with human plus AI instead of pure human annotators, which is again, similar to what we've just been talking about. Theoretically, this scales linearly with AI progress rather than being upper bound by human skills. Yep. Here's the slides from Jan Leakey, co-lead of Super Alignment Team at OpenAI from his talks at Computer Science 25 at Stanford AI Lab, video talk, and he links an hour-long video from Stanford. This is going to be interesting to watch. The sound quality is horrible. Well, I got some reading to do and I will report back on what I find. I hope this was useful. Last and final reminder that a lot of this is speculation. We don't yet know what's happening. So if next week all this turns out to be fake news, please don't be mad. I never said any of this was real, but it does seem like it's aligned with a lot of the research that we're seeing. That's what makes it so interesting. Anyways, if you made it this far, you're a trooper. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe. We got a lot more stuff coming. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.